is pretty much agreed in the mainstream um, culture that meditation or mindfulness is a helpful thing, a beneficial thing. And as time goes on, there's more and more research that seems to indicate that this is the case. And we're very good at um, amassing, obtaining and amassing evidence in this way. That's our strong point. We might not be so good at knowing why, understanding why mindfulness or meditation is a beneficial thing. So that's what I want to talk about today, really, to have a look at that. Just have a little look at um, why is it helpful? How is it helpful? And um, somebody might say, well, we don't need to know that. We just need to practice and that's good enough. But it, it isn't good enough, really, because insight is a big part of it. Insight is a huge part of it. So it's possible to be a kind of um, kind of a dumb meditator in the sense that even though our practice might be very assiduous, we might stick at it properly, we just do it and somehow even after years and years of practicing we may not have a lot of insight and that's quite normal. It is quite normal to um, carry on being fairly insightless. And I'd go so far as to say um, that a lot of us in the West, when we practice something like um, meditation or some spiritual practice, We get it, but we don't get it. It's as if we um, we glory in the actual thing itself, but we don't see what it's about, which is more important. Or as Wei Wu Wei puts it, we're too busy worshipping the teapot to actually drink the tea. We don't realise it's just it's just drinking the tea, really. It's not about how great the teapot is. Although it might be a nice teapot. There's no reason why it shouldn't be a nice teapot. And there's no reason why we shouldn't all sit around in a nice ceremony and drink the tea. But it's not about that, it's about drinking the tea. It's kind of like we're too sophisticated to see that. On the whole, as a general kind of a comment. So one good way to get into this a little bit more is to look at the difference between thought and consciousness. And if we can differentiate between the thinking mind and consciousness, that's hugely helpful because it's our lack of a, um, insight into the difference, the profound difference between these two things that confuses us. And it does confuse us, it confuses us plenty. So for example, we could say that our biggest bit of uh, portion of confusion comes from thinking that, from thinking that thought can drive meditation or that meditation, we can enter into meditation because thought says it's a good thing and thought tells us how, which is exactly um, what we're doing in the West and no doubt other places as well. We have an idea of it all, a technical understanding of it all, technical grasp of it all, and then we proceed on the basis of this understanding, which means that everything we do stems from that understanding and that's just never going to work. It's never going to work because the only way meditation can be helpful and the only way meditation can be meditation is if we somehow separate from thought 
So there is this key element of the separation of who I am from what I think I am and who I am from my thoughts. There's a gap. So the two aren't the same thing at all. So cultivating that gap is what it's all about. If we can call that anything we want, but it always comes down to cultivating the gap between thought and consciousness. So that consciousness isn't subservient to thought, isn't playing second fiddle to thought, which the thinking mind seems sees as being the right and proper way of things, obviously. Naturally it would. We can perfectly easily understand why it would. So that the whole trick of it, even though it's not a trick, but the whole thing of it is if my practice of meditation comes out of thought, then it is thought and there's no gap between thought and consciousness. And if I intend to meditate, intend to practice mindfulness, then similarly, there is no gap between thought and what I'm doing. My intention is thought. And once we understand that, we can see what a very um, difficult thing it is to escape from intention. How do I escape from my own intention, my own intentions? Now, that's so easy to say, so easy to explain. I want to escape from my intention, from being trapped in intentions the whole time, which is the same thing as being trapped in thought because that is our intentions. So as soon as I say that, my intention, what I've actually said is my intention is to escape from my intentions. So I can't intend as a means of escaping from my intentions. That is a complete no-no. But how do I do anything without intending to do it, without planning to do it, without wanting to do it, without having some sort of an agenda to do it or some sort of understanding that it is a good thing to do? And so that's really baffling. It's totally baffling. In fact, the more adult we are, the more sophisticated we are, the more mature we are in the ways of the world and the more experienced we are and skillful we are, the more of a problem it is. Insurmountable problem. It's not a problem, it's an impossibility. And this is a funny thing, because when we start out in life, it's the easiest thing in the world to do something without intending to do it, without planning to do it, without thinking that it's a good idea to do it. That is the easiest thing. Even to say that it's easy implies there's some sort of resistance there to be overcome, and there isn't. It happens. It happens. And then we can ask, well, what, what, what? what what is it that happens? It is everything. Our life happens. It isn't a function of our thought. It isn't a function of our agenda. And that's a very strange thing, even though if it happens to be the case that we are living in that spontaneous way, it doesn't seem like a strange thing because it is um, entirely natural. It is, that is what it means to live naturally, I, not in any contrived or artificial way. So if it's natural, then it isn't strange in one way. In that way, it isn't strange. But from the point of view of how we normally think about things and how we look, we always look at things. What we're saying here is that life proceeds independently from my thoughts or ideas and by intentions, which means that it proceeds independently 
of me, which means it has nothing to do with me. Nothing at all to do with me. It's got nothing to do with you if you can grasp it, says David Bowie in one of his earlier albums. And although that too sounds like a fairly straightforward sentence, it has nothing to do with me. It is difficult because the only way we know anything is because it has something to do with us, with me. That's how I construct the world. In other words, my world is composed of things that are relevant to me and that um, do have something to do with me. What's more, there's a very strong instinct to to um, build on that and to make the world more and more relevant to me. I.e. to have for me to have a place in it, to be centre of it, to have a place. In it. So in other words, if I am a member of society, which almost inevitably I'm going to be, my impulse is to do stuff that is relevant within this, within the um, framework that is society, within that context. Because anything else is not going to be acknowledged, recognised by anybody, is not going to um, get any validation. So what I'm, what I mean, what I think I mean, is that our activities are always in the direction of doing stuff that is relevant, doing stuff on purpose, not doing random stuff, not doing stuff that doesn't make sense to me or anyone else. It always has to make sense. In other words, we play the game that has been given to us to play. And that game reaffirms my sense of myself. The two possibilities inherent in a game is that I can win the game or lose the game. If I win the game, that's very um, relevant to me. It's in entirely relevant to me. It does have something to do with me. If I win a game, that has something to do with me because I've won it. It has everything to do with me. If I lose the game similarly, that has everything to do with me as well. And we can, we, we can go so far to say that almost everything we do is a game in this sense because it reflects on me, either on my success or my failure. But it says something about me. Yeah, I'm wearing this and I'm wearing that. That says something about me. The type of cigarettes I smoke. Dunhill International or whatever the hell says something about me. Everything says something about me. And yet that's got nothing to do with life. Because as we've just said, life is entirely irrelevant to me, has nothing to do with me. So we could see straight away that we don't care about life. It's utterly meaningless to us. It's, it's, we have no interest in it at all. But if we can bend life to make it relevant or personalise it in some way, then it's interesting. So we're interested in what we do with life, not in life itself. But what we do do with life is to distort it so it becomes a reflection of our own agendas, our own way of looking at things. So we get trapped in this kind of little loop or little cul-de-sac, which is me constantly reaffirming um, the way that I look at things as being right. And I reaffirm the way I look at things as being right by purposeful activity. Purposeful activity is so fantastic, as we as we say. It's great. Oh, look, you're doing stuff purposefully. How amazing. Well, it's only amazing if you can do it successfully, if you can win, obviously. 
But if you can do stuff purposely and actually do it, we're in awe, we're in total awe, because that's what it's about according to our culture. That's what it's about. We worship the successful doer. We look up to them. We wish we could be like them. We might go and hang out with them or be seen in their vicinity. Hoping so that some of that glory will rub off on us. And that seems straightforward enough because it is straightforward enough and it's very familiar. But again, the twist is that purposeful behaviour has nothing to do with reality, has nothing to do with life. That's not living. It's me confirming a position that I've arbitrarily taken as being the one and only right true position, which it isn't. So in other words, purposeful activity is how I extend myself to cover all the space, to fill all the space, to um, occupy all the space. So if I'm supremely successful, I occupy all the space, me being successful, but it's all me. And that means because it's all me, there's nothing which has got nothing to do with me because that's got nothing to do with me. So there's only me and there isn't the other, which is probably a more succinct way of putting it, which obviously is a more succinct way of putting it. So I've crowded out the other. So that's what purposeful activity does. It crowds out the other. And the other is everything there is. That's, that's all that there is, is other. Because this me is just the game, which we're hooked into. So, when we think that meditation is something that we can do via intention or on purpose, because it seems like a good idea, we've actually turned it into a, just and yet another way in which the self or the ego can extend itself. And that feels good for the self or ego to extend itself. It's like building an empire. We get to conquer everything that isn't us, put our stamp on everything. So that feels good. It doesn't feel good for a healthy reason because what I'm doing is hiding from reality and I'm able to fool myself for a while that reality is all about me. But what I'm really doing is um, getting caught up in a little loop. That's really eventually, eventually prove itself to be sterile, or the, the worst form of suffering there ever could possibly be, which is what happens when we drive out the other. A terrible claustrophobia, which we can't see as long as we stay busy and keep on believing, keep on um, believing in the sanctity of our goals. So that becomes, busyness is an anaesthetic, it kind of takes away the pain. So we stay busy rather than start to feel the pain that comes from the kind of claustrophobic sterility that we have created for ourselves with our purposefulness. But obviously this whole thing is not going to a good place. So then when we, we think about, well, how is meditation or mindfulness helpful or beneficial? We can see very clearly because we are separating from this whole endeavour which is the endeavour of thought or which is also the endeavour of the self or the ego. And that's all the same thing. The activity of thought is the activity of the ego or self. So this is something we don't tend to focus on because our way of looking at mindfulness or meditation is to see that it's something can, that can help the self or ego escape from the hideous pain. Or maybe it hasn't reached the stage of being hideous yet. Maybe it's just pain of whatever degree. So we, we see this as something that the self can do in order to free itself from the suffering. But it isn't, of course, because Anything the self does 
is the self. Anything the self does comes out of its agenda, its understanding of the world, its goals, its intentions. It is itself. All the self can ever do is itself. That's what we mean when, that's what I mean when I keep on saying that the self extends itself and fills all the space. Everything I think, everything I purposefully do, it's all just me. Which means that I'm not really getting anywhere because there's nowhere to get, there's nowhere for the self. How can there be somewhere for the self to go or to to progress or to develop itself? So we like to think on some level, whether it's consciously or unconsciously, that every day I'm getting better and better and I'm doing the good things to get better and better, but the self is never getting better and better. There is no better and better. It's always treading water on the very same spot. So the self is resistance to other, resistance to life, resistance to reality. So in one way, in conclusion, we can say that meditation in one particular way is not at all helpful, not at all beneficial. It's not helpful for the self. It's not beneficial for the, it's not beneficial for our opinions about the world, our ideas about the world, our beliefs about the world. It's completely unhelpful because it will um, annihilate or, or um, destroy all my opinions if I practice meditation and keep on practicing in a genuine way, then all my opinions will be destroyed. I don't know how long it'll take, but there will be all my beliefs, pictures of the world, or my theories of the world will be destroyed. That's the one thing I know. And my opinions about the world, my prejudices, prejudicial attitudes towards the world, my understanding of the world is me projected out onto the world. So what I'm really saying here is that meditation isn't a friend, isn't going to help, isn't beneficial from the point of view of the ego or self-construct. So we have to be very careful with it. If we're doing it because we believe that the meditation can help or benefit the sense of self that I have, that we have. And obviously we do think that because the only reason we do anything is because it seems like a good idea, a helpful, advantageous thing to do from the point of view of our everyday sense of ourself. And Meditation absolutely isn't that. Okay, thanks for watching.